Okay, second to last chapter called Amida. Um, and in the Hebrew, we're on page Kuflam, but in English, we're on 244. Wow, what an accomplishment to go this far in the Sefer. Mm -hmm. I, usually we get this far in the Sefer, usually it's just me left in the end. Vayamod Pinchas Vayipalel. And the source of this language of Amida connoting Tfila is Vayamod. Pinchas stood up. And what was happening was the Jewish people were, were dying from a plague after the aftermath of, of the Benot Midyan. And Pinchas was not going to stand there and let this happen. He didn't know what to do. And Moshe was frozen. So Pinchas got up and in an act of zealousness and violence, he actually ironically stops the plague. So Pinchas is awarded with the bris of Shalom, the covenant of peace. And, um, and when he does this, the Chazal explained that he's actually davening. And there's a big halachic debate is, are you allowed to bring a weapon into a shul? Where does the halachic debate come from? Well, a shul is modeled after the altar and the altar lengthens lives. And that's why you're not allowed to hew the altar out of, out of, um, out of uh, metal. You have to use blunt objects to cut the altar. You can't cut it with metal objects because metal objects shorten man's, man's length of life. And then the mizbech is supposed to lengthen the life. Uh, for that reason, when you bench, you're supposed to remove the knife from the table also. The other reason that's brought down is that there was once a guy who was benching, and he got it to, up to the uh, paragraph of Neish Shalayim, and he saw that the, the Harban Bais was still in existence, and he was so devastated by the lack of a temple that he stabbed himself in the stomach. Oh, wow. So we remove the knife from the table because there are people who actually care that much about the base makers. Think about that. But anyway... Um, the, the first reason that, that Mizbeach, the altar lengthens your life in a knife. So there's a whole halach debate. You can't bring a weapon into a shul. So there's a debate. Is it Tzitzel Is it just a long knife? Like, And it comes from this case of, of Pinchas, that Pinchas stood in the machana and he had to bring a, and he had to, he was, maybe he was outside of the machana when he brought a spear in because he couldn't have been, he couldn't have been inside with the weapon in the inner camp where the sanctuary was. And from there, the post can learn that you're not supposed to bring a weapon into the inner sanctuary. Uh, and then there's a whole debate, what do soldiers do in the army? Yeah. And they come in and they have, in Hakotel, back in more peaceful times, they had a locker. And if you were if you were a soldier, you would bring your weapon, you would lock it up while you dive in, because otherwise it's illegal for them to abandon their weapon. Yeah. Um, yeah, people bring the concealed carry weapon. Well. Right, so so then the post can talk about things that are, if it's covered up, is it okay? Is, is, a, is a short gun different than a long weapon that people distinguish between weapons? So a long uh, a shotgun would be a problem, but a short a handgun would be a problem. What if it's a sawed-off shotgun? I don't know. That's what I learned about from, from the movies. Sawed-off shotguns are, are legal also because of their power. Um, but but yes, yeah, so that's a good question. But the, it all stems from this idea that Pinchas was with a weapon in the Machine. It's an interesting halachic aside. In any event, um, he does what's called Amida. When we daven Shimon Esrei, we, don't, we call Shimon Esrei as a colloquialism, even though there are 19 blessings. And on Shabbos, there are seven blessings. But in reality, it's not called Shiva, and it's not called Shah Esrei. It's not called Shimon Esrei. It's called Amida, or the Amida. And it comes from this, this moment in which Pinchas stands, prays, and he stands together. Okay, so Amida Betfila. What's amazing is that everything was bottled to God. What does that mean? It means that according to Chazal, when Pinchas did what he did, he actually died. He actually, his soul went out because it, it contradicted every fiber, fiber of his being. What he had to do was an act of zealousness. Imagine like a, a kid who studies in yeshiva his whole life and he's taught make peace, not war, and then he has to go to war and kill someone, right? Like that whole thing. The whole thing is, is against his very nature. So Pinchas actually dies in this moment. Um, and he was sort of completely bottled to what God wants. By the way, one of the ways we understand the harshest of all mitzvahs, which is the slaughtering of Amalek, is through this prism. So how do we understand that the Torah commands us, especially Jews, right, to engage in essentially genocide? How does that make any sense? It's a very difficult question. I'm not trying to cover this extensively, but I'll give you one answer from Rav Aaron Lichtenstein Zetzal. Uh, he suggests that, that, that when Shaul, Shaul kills, refuses to kill Agag, and he has a problem killing women, he has a problem with the, the notion of killing maybe the animals, which is part of the commandment. So 
he, Hashem gets very upset with Shaul. So not only is it a commandment to kill him, but Hashem's angry when someone has mercy. So what's that about? The answer is that by Shoal saying it's okay to kill X member of a Malik, but not Y member, mm-hmm. it means that Shoal, you're okay with killing. You're just not okay with killing this person or this person. In other words, you, you yourself have already created a new moral system. But, but the, the notion of killing anyone itself suspends the very idea that that, that I'm using human morals in this moment because human morality should say it's, it's forbidden to kill anyone, right? Murder or war. Who are you? Why is, why is that person's blood any thinner than yours? So that was Reviron's approach to this whole Malik business. Um, I have other approaches also. I can give a share on it. But in the meantime, Pinchas does something which requires bitulatsmi, bitulatsmo, meaning I don't exist now. If I put my own seichel into what's going on here, by, by, by human justice, I have no right to do what I'm about to do, right? You have no right to go to war. You have no right to, 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 have, to dispute someone else's rights over your rights by human justice. So there, there always is, and I know I understand the theological problems with this and the political problems with invoking God's law to, com, to, to engage in war. I get it. But I'll just, just suspend that for a moment. When he does this, Pinchas is batel. Pinchas doesn't exist. It's all, he's just channeling God's will. In that moment. That's the way the, the Sfarim understand Pinchas. Pinchas completely disappears from his own existence and he's channeling what God wants. Didn't change his name then after that? Well, he gave, him a, he gave him a covenant whereby Pinchas is now uh, a Kohen forever, even though he wasn't the line of Kahuna. The line of Kahuna did not go to him, it went to the other side of Aaron's family, right? So it was they give it to the cousin. So, so betel in the kash brach of shasi, hefech mamida he yeshiva. And the opposite of standing is sitting. I know matzav haba ketotzal mizeh shemar gish ba'atzmo shatzmo sav kveid those alav alkein who yoshev. So, what are you feeling when you sit down? I need to sit. But why do you sit? Because you're tired. Relief, right? Your physical urges overcome you, and you sit down because you you are subservient to your physical needs, right? I can't stand anymore. So Amida is a holy spiritual physical status because even though it's uncomfortable, you're staying all the time. One of the things that we, the, the spiritual of what do we do when we are doing running, it's a lot of fighting through pain, fighting through discomfort, right? Knowing that the mind is much greater than the body, and that you can do things that are so much beyond what you're physical, physically uh, rational, rationalized you can, you can do. And that when you're at your wall, that's when you, that actually, one of the things the trainer said to us was amazing. He said, he said, when you hit your wall, when you hit that point, when you can't go anymore, he says, just remember one thing is like all your months of training were for that one moment, that one moment you think you can't do anymore. That's like the greatest moment. So this is, that's bottle. It's bitter. That's me. I don't exist right now. There's someone else taking over. Hashem is taking over my life. Now translate that to spiritual things, right? Translate that to, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to go to Minion, but I'm here for God. I'm uncomfortable and I can't give any more tzedakah, but I'm, I'm really here for a Kaddish Baruch. But I wonder if he wasn't, uh, he has at that moment, and I guess it maybe fits into this, is that he was so overcome with uh, what was going on that he, that he, he just, uh, like you say, either God channeled through him or, yeah. acted, or what he just, he wasn't right. thinking, he wasn't. Like, like a trans state almost. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, that he said that he just reacted to what he was seeing. Right, right. There, there is a, but there is a, um, there's a state in which the human being has to, leave, the, the human mind and the, the, the mm-hmm. seichel hayasher has to leave in order to allow, mm-hmm. right. to allow yeah, someone to take over. Fight fight By the way, we mind. do this. The reason why people enjoy alcohol and drugs is because they like, lo- there's something deeply spiritual about losing your, your, um, your physical side. But that could be actually sitra achar, could be the evil side also. I mean, you have to understand that when you when you drop when you drop your control, it's either deeply spiritual because the Kaddish Baruch Hu is taking over, or it's deeply spiritual because uh, because you you feel another there's, there's something else. To, anytime we let anything else take over our mind, it's a very powerful moment, right? So this way, you know, it's not nonsense when you see in these different uh, movements, these churches where they kind of like, they go into these trans states. What they're doing is it's, it's a, it's a vote, but it's a vote of Zara. It's a strange vote. Taking drugs is a vote of Zara. 
it's a strange of fire, right? Um, and so here you have the story of Pinchas who allows God to step in and take over in the moment. And it's the opposite of sitting. Sitting is basically I am kafuf, I am bent, I am dependent upon my physical limitations. I am, I'm, I'm physical. I have nothing, I can't do anything beyond what my body is capable of doing. And therefore, when I'm standing, right, everything is subservient to the one before whom I stand. Know before whom you are standing, which is the puzzle that often appears over an iron codish that has letters on it. So, and your spiritual kochot are now in front of you. So think about that as a meditation for a moment. And you get up to stand and say, Shimon Esri. Right? All of a sudden, I'm just completely bottled now to God. God, open up my mouth and let my lips deliver your praises. Because I'm, it's not me anymore. What do you mean when you say bottled? Bottled means I, nullified. I am nullified. I'm, I, I don't exist. I am a, I'm a channeling of God's will. But that's kind of the opposite of what Tila is. Tila is you... Trying to connect yourself to there are there are ten expressions of tefillah, right? So right. <laughs> so so each mode of tefillah. Some are identifying needs on the ani, right? Mm -hmm. Some are recognizing your sense of of loss and you know I'm out of words. Some are identifying with your joy. Well, those live within the human ex the human mm -hmm. um, experience. But the one we're describing here now is is beyond the human experience. Right, this is where you really start to connect beyond yourself. So, and we talked about a little bit in the, in the previous chapter as well, when you connect your prayers with the prayers of others, mm -hmm. the world, the universe, expanding outward. Same thing is going on over here. So, the whole kochos so omdim mukhan lechado v'techef imamida. And as you stand, shehi hitzbatlut nofelat hamechitza hagedol shben olvimpo. The giant barrier that is between you and God falls down at that moment. I mean, that, that's an amazing thought. But I dive out of a sitter, obviously, but it's, it's always powerful if you remember the words to close your eyes because you can really envision that you're not, you're present with the other people, but you're not really, you're, you're, you're with God. Shuha guf in tabotav, my body, my human desires, my human wants, my needs. Vazma meila bahad vekos atsuma. I, I like to actually distinguish. There's one level of existence is to is to live in the world of Ratzon. I want. Higher level is to live with I need, right? Just what you need. You don't necessarily have to get everything you want, but what you need is essential, right? Shelter, roof over your head, clothing, food. Those are needs, right? Wants is what kind of food, right? all those mm -hmm. other things. And then beyond that, beyond wants and needs are no needs at all. Right? That's a very, very high level. And then at that point, you're, you're just uh, channeling. We all live with this contradiction. We're physical and we're spiritual. And, um, and that's, that's the, the, the rope. We, that's the, you know, the, the walk that we walk in this, in this world. We're kind of both. And we have to contend with the fact that we're physical. So all of, so Rabbi Kiva Tatz was speaking to us in this conference. Also, one of we had B.D. Deutsch. We had all, all the kinds of speakers from all over the world spoke to us. So... One of the things he points out was that it's a famous piece from Rav Hirsch, I don't know if you quote Rav Hirsch, but that the language for clothing, right, why is it we need clothing? Because when we sinned, we sensed that we were part animal and that embarrassed us. The awareness of a physical goof is embarrassing. Animals don't, don't have that problem. They're not a soul in a body. They're not embarrassed of their body, right? So, you know, people walk through with poodles and they put little clothing on them. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. I mean, maybe they're cold, but. It's ridiculous for for prag for, uh, for you know reasons of clothing, but what is the word for clothing? Right, think about it for a second. Begin says refers to Russian bogade to rebel. There's an inherent there's an inherent awareness of your and what is lavush? Lavush is busha, embarrassment. Right, all of those words and there's a ton of different words that deal with clothing and deal with covering up, and um, and concealing and also being this inner shame. That's associated with clothing because there's an awareness. I have goof and I have desires and I'm, and I'm really supposed to be better than this, but this soul is stuck in this physical confines and that's very hard. So before the sin, 
the Chazal tell us that our skin was made of light, or, and afterwards our skin became skin, or with an ayin. And when the olive changes to an ayin, <clears throat> something interesting is taking place. We're going from, um, <clears throat> we're going from a, a uh, what do you call it? A, uh, an ah sound that doesn't have, it doesn't make noise, right? Ah to ah, ah or makes a sound. It's a big difference. It's whether you notice it or not. On so someone. She's in. Just let her in. Yeah. All right. I just saw it on the screen. So at that moment, at that moment that, that we switch from or from light to skin, right? It's the same thing. It was just that it was, according to some versions of the of that medrash, we were actually see through, just like a soul. It wasn't like this. Uh, it wasn't like you saw like our muscular system, our skeletal system, our muscular and the, and the, and, the, and the you know the various arteries and it was, you would actually see completely through. Just it was a soul, it was the shama. And the problem is that the skin covers up the shama, and then there's a lack of awareness. So there's an embarrassment, and so we're embarrassed of that. We cover up not because we're embarrassed of our bodies. We cover up because we're embarrassed that we have bodies. Because we are we're, because we're part animal, and that's that's embarrassing for us. Uh, and we want to be just souls. Our neshama wants to just be a soul, right? So this is all part of the the mixture. So there's a so what happens when we dive in? We shouldn't just start stripping down. When we dive in, but when we dive in, we are actually embracing the soul part of who we are. And so all of the physical needs kind of fade away to the background. Bad drop, you don't feel it. You're not experiencing, and that's Amida. The, the, the notion of standing up as opposed to sitting means you're not kafa if you're not subservient to your physical needs, but rather you are above them, you rise above those needs. At that moment, we can achieve, we're primed to achieve real closeness to God through tefillah. All right, so let's go on to the next paragraph. Mavur Khan, and I don't have the English, so I'm not sure what paragraph we're up to, but... Amida is the language that's used for tefillah. Are you going to daven Amida? In Israel, they say that. Gam im lo yiftach piv levakesh. Evidently, even if you don't even open your mouth to make a request, Amida implies prayer. Because tefillah is the notion of becoming batel, becoming a subservient, and... and uh, Nullified before God. If you look at Chavos uh, Levavos, writes, It's fit for you, my brother. It means completely um, that that I'm lowering myself before God, before. God is lofty and higher, and in light of His praises and thanksgiving to Him and His name, and send, casting all your all your burden onto Him. Therefore, Amida is is tefillah. Even though the obligation of standing is only when you're saying other parts of you don't have to stand. All of them are levels that you can go up to Hashem in Shemana. So she golat hakoteret v'ikra tefila, which is the the capstone of the prayer experience. It's Shemana. Sorry, it's the ultimate level. It's the kadosh of Hashem. V'nimsa shehen hachana lematzav zeh shel amida, and and everything else is a preparation for that status called amida. So amida is not only a term for prayer for his batlus, but it is the ultimate point in the davening, the amida. By the way, Amida also is one of the languages for prophecy. As it says, that Avram was still standing before God. That it was a time of prophecy with great connection. And a, and a profound closeness that there was never matched. Madriga Nevoa. So, in truth, and you can help me with the translation here, um, the level of tefillah is partial. partial. 
mix or mixat, sorry, mixat madregat sa nevua. It's part of nevua. Kamosh kazvatur, pechaz til now, actually, this factors in the halacha. What's the lacha? Shekach hayu osim chasidim vanchem aisa, shayum is bodem mechonim, mechavnim, betfilas ma atu magin le his pashtus agashmis, his garvas roch, sechaz atu magin le karov, the maz nevua. That the Hasidim Rishonim, the original righteous ones, would stand an hour in advance before Tfila and prepare until they got to this point that they felt they were almost up to the point of Nevuah. It's almost prophetic at that moment, right? It has to be genuine. You know, sometimes you have these uh, I call fresh backs that come back from Israel and they're like, maybe they're sincere, maybe, but I'm just cynical about them, but maybe they're not sincere. I have no idea. But like, you have to really develop this. Like, this is, it doesn't require, um, um, you know, Incredible uh, noise and gyrations. And, uh, you know, if you really want to be in this place, you really have to completely. And I know we spoke about Shockland last week, mm-hmm. but really want to be in this place. It's it's something that that's not necessarily observable on the outside. It's something that's it's an inner process that is close to prophecy well, and so prophecy. Trans- so yeah, a transcendental kind of experience that you're yeah. going from your right physical almost mm-hmm. to that. Transcendental state yeah. where you are maybe more at one with God than you could be in your right. And you you have to, and all meditations are sometimes getting beyond the things that the physical things that are bothering you, yeah. moving past those, and the ones that are from a good source and some that are from a Vodazara source, but they all are trying to get you beyond the moment. And then you know, and then there's another school. A therapeutic school that tells you to feel all these things, to really experience, which is part of part of getting over things is to is to is to coexist with the pain. It's another aspect, but at least this avoda here is about moving. It's not that's not part of your life. It's not part of your definition. It's something you. Uh, Asher used to say about rain. My brother used to say about rain. It's just you know just walk through and don't everyone gets all tight. Their muscles get tight when they walk through rain, right? Why do we do that? Because you're uncomfortable. But it's just a just remember that uh, that. Pain and discomfort is just is just a feeling that you don't, it's a it's an ordinary feeling you don't ordinarily feel. It's just something you're not used to, right? But if you can kind of you know walk with your head head up straight and don't don't get all tight, you know you'll actually be a lot more comfortable in the rain. It's sort of just like 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 zoning out of the physical needs. So that's that's the transcendental experience that you're describing is exactly uh, the way we approach all uncomfortable things in life. Um, and you'll find that the people, leaders who are uncomfortable with uncomfortable moments are people who are incredibly influential. Uh, people who every time the time the going gets tough, they bail out, they run away, or they react harshly or sharply and in a way that's inappropriate. Those people ultimately have no mastery over their, over their physical um, side, and they will, they will not inspire us, right? right. So that's, that's important. Um, so I always like Kiddush to me I love Kiddush because I like food but I like Kiddush it's a fun time for people to get together but one of the challenges of rabbis you want to schmooze with people also in a normal world you want to schmooze you want to, but then you have this delicious food and like what am I going to do I have to challenge but I want to schmooze with people so I could like sit there and like you know I want to I want to eat it so one of the things once in a while I didn't do it every week I tried to work on okay I'm not going to have any Kiddush this week just so I could absolutely connect Beyond the beyond right now, what I want to be doing is not talk to this person as I want to be eating. That's what I want to be doing. So the avoda for me is I have to just take one one step away from that, so that way I could connect with people. And my own private little struggle, which is such a small struggle, but it's like nothing. But my own little private private um, struggle with physical urges will allow me to connect more to others on the outside, and it allows us with Hashem all the more so. So. Um, so anyway, so so yeah, so so the uh, and you recognize if you're if you go to like a business high power business meeting, the person who's running the show really is not eating. I don't know why it is. I mean, no offense, I love this. I mean, uh, the moment this class is over, I'm taking at least a bagel or, or two or something. Mm-hmm. But but that being that being the case, I can't teach and chew gum at the same time. Mm-hmm. So um mm-hmm. and you get close to prophecy. That's prophetic. Now, what is prophecy? Dveikos, connection with tefillah. So if someone wants to know what is prophecy, you can actually experience a little bit of that in your prayer. What is the Torah saying? 
This is halachic work. The tour is the basis of the Shulchan Aruch, because the Beis Yosef comments on the tour, and on the, the tour is based on uh, and his 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 uh, he's he's uh, from Rabbeinu Asher, the son of Rabbeinu Asher, and so the Rishonim, and then the tour writes his Psak Halacha, so the Rush, the Rambam, and others, and then from there the Beis Yosef had his commentary, and then he took his commentary and condensed it into the Shulchan Aruch. So this is the first time you have a real halachic sefer covering all of Shulchan Aruch. The tour is a person or a sefer? It's a sefer and a person. This is, 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 he's called the, the, the Balaturim. So in the tour, you have halachic, halachas tefillah, and he's writing that tefillah is something you achieve close mitzas nevua, a little bit of nevua. This is not a spiritual sefer, it's a halachic sefer. He's telling you you could experience nevua. We don't have Nevu anymore, but we get a little bit of prophecy. Yes, we don't really understand what he's saying. Come, come, nonetheless. That what does the Rambam say? Mar Now we go to another. Mar is the Rambam's philosophical work. What does he write there in the third section, which is the hardest section really to understand? But that experiencing God in front of you is right is the is is what is yisod and all the works of avoda are about this idea of experiencing godliness in our presence. That wherever your thoughts are, that's where you are. So therefore, if you are, you know, if in your mind, that's why, that's why the future of all of Facebook or Meta now is all about this other universe that you're in, right? Creating alternate reality. And we think that's just playing games, fancy video games, but it's not. It's actually very deep what's happening. The world is going to be, everybody's going to be in another place. Their minds are going to be sort of in this virtual reality. So I don't have to put up with, I don't like my body. I don't like, I don't like my, my life. I don't like my family. I don't like these things. So what am I doing? I'm just zone out. I'm going to create a fantasy world, fantasy island, the pain, the pain. And I'm going to be on this other world and that will be my new life. And all the, right, that's what this whole meta thing was projecting, right? So it's a very frightening thought, but it's also, it's also, you could do it without meta. You don't need, you don't need uh, Facebook to bring you there. You can exist in your mind. So wherever your mind is, that's where you are. So a person in Lo Elena is sick, but they're but they're happy and they feel content, then then they could have much more simcha than a person who's healthy and and uber wealthy and and just miserable. Why does that exist? Why does that happen? Because the truth of avoda is that wherever your mind is, that's where you are, and your mind is the gateway to your soul. So meditation before tefillah is about putting your mind in those places. When you get ready to speak to God face to face, now I'm with God. That's prophecy, a conversation with Hashem. Because the intellect is the base havad. It's a study, base havad is like a, a sanctuary, study hall, a place. I don't know how they translate there, but what? A meeting. A meeting place. A meeting place. It's a meeting place. Where where does the Shekhinah live in the time of the temple? The divine presence resides in the temple. Where does the divine presence reside today? The temple is destroyed. Bilvavi mishkan evne. In my heart. That's Rav Hutner wrote those words. Bilvavi mishkan evne. Everyone knows the words. I think it's like David Melch. Rav Hutner wrote this like 50 years ago. Bilvavi mishkan evne. In my heart, I'll build a, a, a temple. In your mind, in your heart, exists. The reason God destroyed the temple is because we thought he was only in one place. And so we can basically conduct ourselves any way we like in business and in other, other conducts outside of prayer, outside of the temple, in a way that, def- that goes against the ways of Judaism and the Torah. And then we go to the temple, we fix it, we offer a big car bomb, and everything's fixed, right? Cheat on my taxes, but then I'll give a big donation. And I'll honor me at the dinner. It's essentially what we're doing. So God says, Lama li rov The Navi, the Navi is the right? I don't need your karbanos. You think I need a lot of animals? That's what I wanted from you? That's what I wanted, animals? It destroys the temple. You got distracted. Instead, rebuild the temple now inside your mind. 
And so Rekiva and his cohorts decided, let's double down on Torah learning. The Torah will be the sanctuary of, of the mind. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make the new, the new Judaism is going to be Talmudic. That's where it developed. So beforehand it was it was a it was a sacrificial Judaism. So n- now in Tfilah, we can experience that wherever we are. So the, today's Daf Yomi, for instance, was talking about how to, if, if Hashem promised Avraham, how will I know that I will inherit the land? Hashem says, take for yourself, uh, right? take for yourself these sacrifices and offer them. So the Gemara says, how do you do that today without the temple? Very simple. Recite Karbanos in your davening. You recite Karbanos in the beginning of Tefillah and you're offering those Karbanos. What is that talking about? So explains the Rambam that wherever your mind is, that's where the sanctuary is. That's where, that's where God is. That's what prophecy is all about. It's knowing that you don't need to be in a certain place, time, and, 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 and things clicking just the right way, lining up, stars aligning in order for you to experience Hashem. I'm with you in your, in your, in your exile, says God, from wherever you are. Wherever your mind is, I can be there. But if you think about innovation, you think about the history of, of inventions that are making people very wealthy, so it's usually travel is a big part of it, right? Like so whoever owned the trains, whose trains was Rockefeller or trains was railroad, whichever, whichever famous uh, or building, steel, right? Construction. And then giving you experiences and bringing you places or bringing places to you. Amazon ships you all this stuff, right? And, and think about who's the wealthiest guy in the world right now? Um, Tesla. Um, yeah, not pesos is number two. What? Elon Musk. Elon Musk, right. Elon Musk. So what does he do? So think about this. No, I have no idea. I have no idea. But 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 what is but what is the essence of of his wealth? All of his projects, they're amazing. You know, and all the billionaires want to take you to space. Go experience yeah. something. Go go to a place where you don't have to be bogged down with the life that you're living. And go 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 to space. He's making this amazing train system that's gonna travel under the ground like in a tube. Like you'll be like the, you'll be like the the check and the pen that you put in the bank, the tube that goes. That's us. We're gonna be traveling. We're traveling around the country in a tube. This is the first the first accident like that is gonna be terrible, and then afterwards they'll figure it out. But anyway, we're we'll traveling on the ground in a tube. Um, but quickly go somewhere, right away. You don't. Have to, and then and then what's the next frontier? Why is this meta thing a big deal? Because we could take you wherever your mind is. We could just transport you from your living. And Amazon also is bringing you things from elsewhere. And all of a sudden, that stops and everyone freaks out, right? Because the ships are caught in the sea, in the, in, the, in the ocean, in order to do, and can't get in the car, can't go anywhere. And you realize that, that real fulfillment is wherever you are, if you want to be there. So that's what this, this whole thing is trying to tap into, because that's, that's spirituality, and that's what man craves, that's what we want. We want to be somewhere in something. We want to be experiencing something special beyond us, because we know we're limited. We know that we're just an animalistic finite presence that's only a temporary so we want to make our mark on the universe we want to last forever right and men and women do it differently of course men want to they want to um sort of conquer the world and be famous and be known and maybe have like you know kids around the planet right like different uh, different families i built around the planet and uh w- women have a different notion of, of of trying to create permanence and meaning but it's the same thing we all want to be more than we are right now um but but the truth is you can be Right here in your life, you could you could talk to God, and you could be beyond your own physical uh, limits, and that's the ultimate meta experience. Will be when you're beyond your physical limits. So we'll just finish this paragraph. Now we come back to prayer. What is prayer? The commotion is not kabbalas and when we accept the nevua. Hanavi evar of mizdaz mitiv halam. Motion is an exception, but most prophets, when they would experience prophecy, their limbs would shake, and they would go into a trance. Maybe their eyes roll back, right? Uh, like that lady on X Men. Ma'achar shebeshas hanevua when after nevua who pone kulol nafsho. It's just you and your soul, v'sichlo and your intellect. Like they kach misbatim kol kochod deguf. The body doesn't matter anymore. Kam beshas it feel. That's what you experience when you're when you're davening. So prophets would actually go into a, a state where they would 
stop existing for their own. They would channel whatever God's word was, whether it's in a dream, whether it's in a, a trance type state, and they would experience the nevuah, and then they would have to give that over, right? Moshe was different. Moshe was like the only one who was able to experience it in a wake state because he was on such a level, but he was in a constant status of Amida. But that's what we could do when we're davening. It's elevating the soul over the body. He's separating ourselves from this world. So I, I really am encouraged by the trend with video games and stuff because I think it's it means that we're tending, we're 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 we're, tre- we're, we're heading in the right direction. That we want, we know we don't want to live this life. So if you haven't found anything meaningful, you'll go to drugs or shalom, self-harm and those things. But we know that we don't want to be this person. We're embarrassed. We put clothing on, right? So what do we want? We want to be one with God. The soul wants to get back to its source. It's quarry. It was, it was, your soul was cut from a quarry in Shemayim. And it wants that, craves that, right? So how do we get there in a holy way? And mitzvos are bringing us to do it, to elevate the physical. And the ultimate experience is tefillah. So that's really the first section of the Zamida. We'll continue with Zamida next time. I know we took a long time to say very little, but, um, but we'll... No, I think it's...